Sadhguru Jagi Vasudev is a realized master, mystic, and yogi. He has shown the way for people to attain to their natural joy and to live life with experience from one's own inner nature. His presence is filled with grace and compassion. Sadhguru's scientific approach towards spirituality and work towards the upliftment of humanity have received accolades worldwide. The words that come from him in intensity and utmost clarity, from his deep understanding and wisdom, can change the very core of the being. Belonging to no particular tradition, Sadhguru incorporates what is most valid for the modern person from the spiritual sciences. His work, an outpouring of his blissfulness, finds expression in the form of a ceaseless offering to help all beings. Available to all who are willing, Sadhguru's life is an invitation to the Divine through individual transformation. Welcome to the silent revolution of self-realization. Always a manifold way in which people make use of uh, the spiritual processes. For uh, some people, in many places, uh, spirituality and all the spiritual, what, what do you call them? What are those talks called in Hindi? Pravachans. All that pravachan, everything is uh, just the escape from the mother-in-law or cooking. <laughs> For some, it's an intellectual entertainment. For some, they're seeking to learn something. They want to know something new. A few people are wanting to, you know, bring about some changes in their life. They want to become a little more peaceful, a little more loving, a little more something else. Some change they want in their life. Some people are looking for transformation. You know the difference between change and transformation? Hmm? Transformation means nothing of the old should remain. Change means improvement, self-improvement or transformation or some people just try really wanting to get lost into it, dissolve into it. So there are many ways and people are approaching the same thing. It's… Uh, which is the best way? I wouldn't say which is the best way because according to each person's needs, that's how they seek. You can't prescribe the best way to anybody. Right now, generally the human nature is such that uh, whatever they don't have, that's what they will seek. They don't have health, they're seeking health as if it's the ultimate thing. If they don't have money, they're seeking money as if it's the ultimate thing. If they don't have love, they're seeking love as if it's the ultimate thing. Whatever they don't have, that's what they're seeking. That reminds me, <laughs> this happened <laughs> when we were in Trichy. <clears throat> you know Trichy, Tiruchinapalli? It's a, a medium-sized town in Tamil Nadu. In a high school, the teacher came and asked the students, eighth or ninth standard children, if God appears in front of you 
and gives you a boon, what will you ask? <coughs> One boy said uh, those days, you know, Maruti car. I want a Maruti car. Somebody said, I want a bicycle. Somebody said, I want, uh, you know, ten lakh rupees. Like this they went on. <coughs> then uh, the teacher said, you idiots, what will you do with all these things? Ask for intelligence. Ask for knowledge, ask for intelligence. Why are you asking for all these things? So one boy stood up and said, everybody asks for what they don't have <laughs> So, everybody is seeking what they don't have, isn't it? <laughs> now if you go by this, when a human being goes by this process of asking for what he doesn't have, then it's an endless process because what is it that you have? What you have is so little. If you go on asking for what you don't have, you need a thousand years and still you will be nowhere. If you start seeking the next thing that you don't have, it's an endless process, self-defeating process, isn't it? <coughs> it seems to be taking you somewhere but it doesn't take you anywhere. So, uh, what is this about? If you don't seek, if there is no seeking, you don't go anywhere, you know? Why would you go to any place if there is nothing to seek? Because that's the very basis of your activity, desiring and going after it, isn't it? The objects of desire may change and people may think one object is better than the other, but it's not so. Whether you're seeking money or home or intelligence or knowledge or God or this or that, desire is desire, you know. The object of desire just changes the directions of your destination but doesn't change the process of life as such. And the essence of life is in its process, isn't it? Where you got in the end is not the point really. In many ways, right now, the essence of life is how you are experiencing it right now. So, uh, one's quality of life, if we are changing or if you are wanting to experience life in a little better way or in a much better way, whatever, changing the objects of desire is not going to make so much of a difference. It's the way we handle the process which is going to make the difference. But even if life becomes a very pleasant and beautiful experience, it has to happen for every human being. But even if it happens, still you will see there is something within you which doesn't want to settle for just joyful life either. You are very happy and after some time even that doesn't seem to be enough. Because happiness is missing, right now the whole life seems to be pursuit of happiness. If you are joyful, then you will see it's not enough. In fact, if you are very happy, you will do many more things than when you are unhappy. Isn't it so? <laughs> because now you are charged and now there is nothing pulling you back. You have all the enthusiasm to go about and do lots of things. So there is something that this life is longing for. It's not a desire, it's its destination. It is not something, a desire that you created or I created. It is just longing to go towards a certain destination. The only choice that we have is either to move towards this destination consciously or unconsciously. Anyway we are moving, whether to go towards it consciously or unconsciously. If we are dragged towards something unconsciously, even if we are dragged towards heaven, we will suffer the dragging, isn't it? Yes? 
now we grab you and we'll drag you out. You don't know where you're being dragged. You will suffer this. We will take you and put you on a beautiful beach. <laughs> but that's later. But right now, all along from here to there, you are going to suffer it terribly, isn't it? So if you walk towards anything or if life drags you towards a certain direction and you are unconscious about it, you will suffer the process immensely. So if you look at it consciously, if you go towards it consciously, then the process becomes beautiful. That's all the choice we have really. And we, once we are conscious, we naturally hasten the process. Whatever we are unconscious of, and that level we suffer, you must understand this. See, right now you are driving on the street. You are completely unconscious of who is coming behind you, who is coming in front of you. Now you are going to get into one kind of physical suffering. Because you are unaware of the physical reality, physical suffering will come, something is going to break, isn't it? Now uh, you are unaware of uh, what is happening in your body, another kind of suffering will come. You are unaware of what's happening in your mind, another kind of suffering will come. You are unaware of what's happening in your family, another kind of suffering will come. Similarly, wherever you are unaware, that level of suffering will come to you. Is that so? You are getting… this is a holiday, you are getting dead serious <laughs> Once a pirate, no pirate? A pirate walked into the bar. The bartender knew him from long ago, he has seen him just the previous year and now he has come back after his expeditions. He looked at him and said, Hey, what happened to you? You look terrible. The pirate said, No, I am just feeling just about fine. Then the bartender said, but what happened to your leg? Why the wooden leg? Oh, that we were just having a battle with another rival group and I saw a cannonball coming straight at me. Before I could move, it hit my right leg and I am doing fi quite fine with the wooden leg. I am pretty good. Then the bartender said, what about the hook? He said, left hand you have a hook? What happened to that? Oh, we were just having a sword fight for fun and my left hand got chopped off. But I'm doing quite fine with this hook. In fact, it's more useful than the hand <laughs> <coughs> Then he asked, what about the eye patch? You lost one eye, what happened? Oh, that I was just looking up at the sky and uh, a bird poop fell into my eyes. Oh, come on! Who ever heard of anybody losing their eyes for bird poop? How would you lose your eyes for bird poop? No, that was the first day I had my hook on <laughs> Whatever you are unaware of, there you suffer, isn't it? <laughs> There, that brings suffering to you. <laughs> so, we are talking about awareness, awareness, awareness. Awareness is not something that you do actually. <laughs> In fact, the less you s do, the more aware you become within yourself. The less your activity becomes inside, what you call as me, the less that becomes, the more your awareness becomes. The less your personality becomes, the more your presence becomes always. Personality means you have to do a lot to keep it up, isn't it? Yes. Most of the activity that you're doing to keep up your person is unconscious, but you're doing enormous activity to maintain a certain personality, isn't it? If that activity gets lowered, suddenly awareness gets heightened because awareness is not something that you do. The very life is awareness, isn't it? The very basis of life is awareness. You know that you are alive only because you are aware, isn't it? 
If all awareness disappears, at least on this level we can call it death. So, spirituality is not something that you do. If you stop doing all your nonsense, you are spiritual. <laughs> no? Unnecessary nonsense if you stop, spirituality is, you know, it's not something that you have to do and make it happen or create it, it's not so. But still why, if that is so, why am I doing my pranayam in the morning? Oh! <laughs> Even in a resort they made us do it <laughs> I'm sorry, the resort <laughs> That's because uh, there is no breaks in your activity. What you do within yourself, you have no breaks on it. So, we are creating a certain physical, mental and energy situation where everything gets diverted from your activity. Slowly, the practice establishes a situation where the life energies raise to a certain pitch and intensity that uh, slowly the activity becomes insignificant, it's still there. It's still happening, you've seen this in Shunya meditation, you just said, activity is still happening, but it's insignificant. The same activity which was so significant has become insignificant. We have not stopped it. We have not done anything to hold it down, but somehow it has become not so important. You see this happening? When you just sit and meditate in Shunya, everything is happening, but it's no more important. It's lost its significance. It's lost its impact upon you. It's lost its influence upon you. It doesn't mould you anymore. All the activity of the mind stops moulding you. You are no more being moulded by that activity. This… <clears throat> this whole distortion that we have done to life in the form of creating our person, See, when you create your personality, because it's created mostly unconsciously, just a small part of it may be conscious, the rest of it is all unconscious, isn't it? When you create your, un your personality, somewhere, in one way it means somewhere you thought creator has not done a good enough job on you, isn't it? If it needs improvement, Definitely he did not do a good enough job on you, isn't it so? So why would you feel that such a grand creation is not good enough? Something that's so enormous and fantastic is not good enough, why? Because in this simple process of self-preservation, you know, there is a simple basic process which is built into every cell in our body, every worm, insect, animal has this, we also have it. This simple process of self-preservation, we don't know where to contain it. It has just spread itself into everything. Because it spread itself into everything, you have to create a small person of yourself who will defend himself all the time. As we've been looking at in the programs, the only thing that needs preservation is your physical body. Your personality, we must maul it every day. It should be okay, isn't it? If every day if you can make mincemeat out of your personality, you could create another one tomorrow morning, isn't it? Isn't it so? We've been trying to do that gently because if I go very hard at it, you'll run away. <laughs> Gently, step by step, we're trying to make mincemeat out of your personality so that it becomes a flexible aspect. You cannot live without a personality. You need one to exist here, to go about in the world, do your work, manage things. But if it's a flexible thing, 
that in different places as it is necessary for the situation, you can put on the right kind of personality, then it would be fine. But right now, it is like a rock, it sits on you all the time. Anything that doesn't fit into its ambit, it makes you suffer, isn't it? Who drew this caricature that you call as myself? Definitely yourself, but uh, influenced by so many people around you. You know, you're fifteen, sixteen, you go and watch a Mitha Bachchan movie, you come home and try to walk like him unconsciously. <laughs> yes, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes maybe consciously, but most of the time unconsciously, isn't it? <laughs> so, this caricature came into existence because of all kinds of bits and pieces that are gathered. It happened <laughs> when we were in school. There was a boy who was studying with me who had an excellent hand, you know, he could just sketch anybody with whatever kind of distortion he wanted. <laughs> so, there was one very hated geography teacher <laughs> and uh, when he entered the class, this boy had a horrible caricature of him ready on the blackboard. Badly distorted but everybody can clearly recognize who it is <laughs> with all kinds of very bad distortions on him. <laughs> then he walked in and uh, as usual he walks into the class always with a temper. Whether he is talking about the grasslands in America or he talks about the deserts in Africa, he is always in bad temper. <laughs> He… the moment he saw, he just… Uh, one thing he was angry, another thing he was somehow hit by the whole thing, the distortions. <laughs> then he asked, who is uh, responsible for this uh, terrible atrocity? As usual, you know, everybody is suddenly interested in geography, very studious <laughs> and… <laughs> Then he repeated again, who is responsible for this atrocity? He thinks it's an atrocity. We thought it was an appropriate <laughs> thing. Then uh, somebody made up their mind and stood up and said, uh, we really don't know, uh, but uh, it should be his parents. <laughs> this atrocity that you call as myself, it's not your parents. <laughs> this is you. <laughs> Only you can commit this atrocity of distorting yourself into such a tiny possibility when an unbounded possibility was what you were offered. <laughs> With life you were offered an unbounded possibility. You made a, such a bad distortion and made yourself into such a tiny possibility. If you stop creating this caricature, because this caricature cannot exist one day without your support, you need to support it all the time. What meditation means, means in one way you're just withdrawing the support for your personality, that's all. Suddenly it collapses, only the presence is there, the person is no more there. If you could walk on the street like this, if you could operate with people like this all the time, 
that you have no personality, but looking at this person, at this moment, how she is, accordingly you put up a personality, as it is necessary for this person. Now you go to that person, you put up a personality that is necessary for that person, then it would be so much fun drawing new, new caricatures every day. But once you get stuck to a particular distortion, <laughs> that becomes a problem. Every day if you have a new distortion, it's called art. <laughs> if you're stuck with one distortion, then it's called… you're called a freak, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it so? Every day if you're able to create a new distortion, that is artwork, isn't it? If you're stuck with one distortion, you're a cripple. <laughs> So that's the big difference. Sadhguru, when you're talking about personality, we have to have different personalities as a parent, as a husband and at work. In normal living, it becomes very difficult to change the personality. You mean to say people around you won't let you change it? <laughs> Not true. See, right now, Let's say you are going to your work in us. We'll take the work situation because it's less personal for you. <laughs> you are going to work with a certain attitude and a certain… certain person is going to work, which is you right now. Let's say he goes briskly like this every day. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Don't mean a good morning to anybody. <laughs> The way people say good morning, it's very clear they intend to give you a bad morning <laughs> So, suppose you are going like this. Tomorrow morning, if you go, really say good morning to people and smile at them and maybe hold their hand and ask some personal question, talk to them and go in, maybe you'll waste five, ten minutes going into your office. But if people around you are happy, you'll have lot of extra time on your hands because they'll run around and do things better, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. If you have people who are sitting there with a grouse, then you know, they will make your life miserable in so many ways, not one way. You have to live with them, but these people have a grouse against you, they are going to make your life so bad, isn't it? Now, can I change my personality every day? Won't it confuse people? Not at all, they would enjoy you most. Isn't it so? And will it bring down your efficiency of work? Definitely not. It is not because of the compulsion of the situation you've gotten stuck with one personality. It is just that the whole construction of the personality has happened in unawareness. That's why you're stuck with one personality. Now you said, we have one kind of personality at home, another with children, another with, uh, you know, work and outside. If you look at it, it may not be true. You may be functioning in different capacities. The requirement of how you function may be different, but still the basic personality may be same everywhere. The underlying personality is still the same. You can change that also and it will be so much fun for you to change that. It will be absolute fun for you to change that because you can experience a whole new person all the time. <laughs> After all, it's your creation. So why should it be limited to just one way? If God had fixed a personality for you, that's all there is. But when you have built it, like you change your clothes every day in different ways, isn't it? But most people cannot even change that, isn't it? They've gotten used to a certain thing and that's all it is, isn't it so? I think we should have done something today. Everybody should dress in a completely different way and come. <laughs> Not your usual kind of clothes. You're wearing pants all the time, today you wear a sari and come. Just loosen yourself up a little bit, you know, it's important. The reason why what is the very essence of life is missing in people's life is because they become stiff. And spiritual people are stiffer than anybody else, <laughs> isn't it? They are so stiff. Still doesn't answer your question. Hmm? 
There can be changes in the behavior, but your personality remains the same. It remains the same. That's what I'm saying. You are stuck to one personality. It's just the actions are different because the situations are different. But the person is same, isn't it? So the person is same because what your personality is has become you. You are completely identified with it. There is no distinction between you and your personality, isn't it? You have become that. The mask has gotten stuck to your face now. You can't take away the mask. If this mask has to come off, we need something to loosen the glue which has gotten stuck to this. It is identity. So now we are creating various situations where your identity dissolves in a certain way. Meditation or any kind of yoga, practice, whatever it is, just to loosen the identities so that there is a little more flexibility about it. Maybe the whole of it has not come off, but at least you can adjust it a little bit. So mask being totally stuck, at least little you are able to take a breather, that much break it is giving you. But if you work a little more with this, you can take it and keep it off. Now people, when they come to advanced programs, three days or seven days they are in Samyama or Bhavaspandana, the person that you are, you will just simply forget who you are. You don't know who you are. It will become like that because the situation created is so intense and so different. Everything that you know as normal is broken. <laughs> After some time you don't know who is here. After the program is over and you come back, you just wonder, is it me who went through all that? Most people can't believe that they actually went through Samyama and came. <laughs> <clears throat> simply because it's created like that, the whole situation. Not only the meditation process, the situation also is created in such a way that it doesn't assist your personality in any way. The whole thing is to take off all the supports because your personality cannot exist for a moment without your support. If you involve yourself in any intense activity, it could loosen up a little bit. But that is haphazard. For example, let's say you go and play a game. Those moments of total involvement, you may lose your personality. But that is a haphazard way of attempting it. Now we are looking at how to approach it scientifically, how to dismantle the, all the scaffolding that is holding it up. If you have noticed this, people who are very, very committed and enjoying the process of working, they always have more flexible personalities than people who are working towards a goal. Is it so? Have you noticed this? Because hmm? just the involvement with the work, total involvement, those moments the personality becomes little loose. But people who are working towards a goal, that they want this to happen, those people have strong personalities always. The fundamental basis for your personality, the building blocks for your personality is likes and dislikes. I like this, I don't like this. A complex system of likes and dislikes is what your personality is, isn't it? See, what's the difference between you and the next person? Your likes and dislikes are different, isn't it? Now, the basis of yoga is just this, to help you beyond these likes and dislikes. Whether we are talking responsibility or inevitability or whatever else we are talking, fundamentally it is to destroy the process of like and dislike. See, existing in the world with likes and dislikes is a very foolish way to exist. But unfortunately, the logical mind thinks, I'll do what I like, this is my freedom. The very basis of your bondage is in your likes and dislikes. But your mind makes you believe doing what you like is your freedom. Isn't it? All the time, everywhere in the world people believe doing what I like is freedom. Please look at it carefully. The very fundamental basis of your bondage is in like and dislike. To operate sensibly here, even in the physical realm I am saying, even to operate with your work or family, whatever, 
Likes and dislikes make you do stupid things. I like this person, I don't like this person. Now, I cannot function from what is needed in this moment, isn't it? Isn't it so? Now, I don't like this person. Even if this person is doing something wonderful, I cannot see it anymore. Do you see this happening to yourself? I like this person. Even if they are doing terrible things, I cannot see it anymore. Isn't it so? Because the moment you get trapped in this like and dislike, you have no discretion. You lost your discretion. Your intelligence is forsaken. Your awareness is simply impossible once you tra get trapped in likes and dislikes. The moment you say, I like this, getting identified with it is very normal. It's a natural process. You don't have to say, I am going to identify with this light bulb. If you just say, I like this light bulb, you get identified with it. The process will just happen. See, life is set up in such a way for you so that life happens automatically. You just have to sit here and enjoy the bounty of life. But now the problem is, we are setting this forth in a wrong direction, so it is creating suffering. Suppose if it was all in your hands, you have to like it, you have to get involved with it, it's everything is yours. It would be a terrible effort to live, isn't it? Now it's all set up well, you know, the whole software is so well set up. If you just say, I like this, getting involved in it, get dreaming about it, this, that, that, everything just happens by itself, isn't it? Everything that is necessary to take you in that direction just happens, isn't it so? So, this is just life assisting you, but it has no discretion. If you like hell, it will take you to hell. It happened once. Mm. What do you call a person who hires people in a corporation or whatever? HR. HR? Okay. The HR director in a corporation died and went to heaven. <laughs> there uh, Saint Peter said, uh, See, because uh, you are the first HR person to come to heaven. <laughs> we will give you a choice. If you want, you can stay in heaven because you got the passport. But before you go to heaven, if you want, you can have a view of hell. If you wish to stay there, you can also stay there. This is a lady HR person, she said, no, why would I want to go to hell? I want to go to heaven. He said, why wouldn't you want to have a look at it? He said, okay. She got in the elevator, went zing down. <laughs> then the elevator doors opened and it opened into a beautiful garden. On the poolside, very beautiful people are swimming, you know, sunbathing, and there's a wonderful golf course and then a nice clubhouse, the works. She said, oh, this is great hell. <laughs> she had a view of that and uh, then Saint Peter said, okay, you have a view of heaven, then you choose. Then she got in the elevator, it went up, <laughs> supposed to be down and up, okay. That's a direction, at least you better know. <laughs> now we are down. <laughs> so, there they opened the doors and then she saw lots of clouds, people just floating in the clouds, playing harp and you know. She said, okay, this is also fine, but I think I'll go to hell. All my friends are there, <laughs> this golf, I'll go. So they put her in the elevator, she just went down and again the doors opened, it was a harsh desert. 
everybody all dried up without food, in terrible condition, everything. She said, what is this? Last time when I came, there was a garden, there was a pool, there was a golf course. What happened? So they said, uh, that was just the first day, you know. <laughs> now your staff. <laughs> That was the interview. Now you're staff. <laughs> All your life you did this to people. So this is your choice. <laughs> your personality. I don't know if you're working in places, at least. Uh, if you are HR, is there anybody HR? Oh. <laughs> Especially if you are HR, maybe, <laughs> you also. Uh, you are supposed to size up a person, you know. Somebody new walks into your office, you are supposed to size them up, where they will fit into this whole machine of an organization. So, if you are willing to look, people's personalities are always hanging out, you know. They need not say anything, they need not do anything. If you just look at them properly, the very way they stand, sit, you don't need any great yogic intuition. Simply a simple observation of a person, the very way they stand, the way they hold their hands, this, the way they smile, the way they do things, their personality is just hanging out of them. So it's so obvious to everybody except to yourself, you know, <laughs> that's the whole thing. You are my perfect mirror, you show me what I'm not in the Layer and layer you peel off me The pain it is but the joy it brings So thank you for showing me what I'm not For showing me what I could be